Marvelous grace, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together for this conference. We ask Heavenly Father for your blessing upon it and upon each of our speakers. We pray for each of our, each of our guests here again this, this day as well as throughout the four days of this conference, again for your blessing and for our edification as we seek to learn, uh, hopefully again, not, not only all the varying views, but again your view as it would come from your word. We ask these things now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Okay, I uh, had a little rough start here getting, I'm using a computer that's not my own, so I thought we all need just a, just a, a moment of laugh. Having come from Detroit, uh, it's a very ethnic area, and it was when I was growing up. And so I found this little, this little ditty, I guess we'll call it. As a customer walks into the store, he asks, on what aisle can I find the Polish sausage? And the clerk looks at him and says, well, are you Polish? And the guy, clearly offended, says, well, yes, I am, but let me ask you something. If I had asked for Italian sausage, would you ask me if I'm Italian? If I had asked for German bratwurst, would you ask if I was German? Or if I had asked for a kosher hot dog, would you ask if I was Jewish? Or if I asked for a taco, would you ask if I was Mexican? And the clerk says, well, no, probably not. Well, then he says with a deep, self-righteous voice, then why did you ask me if I'm Polish when I asked for a Polish sausage? The clerk says, because you're in Home Depot. We're going to learn a little something again uh, this afternoon about sanctification from the broad picture, the, uh, the umbrella view, as I would call it. And uh, I, I guess the place to start would be where I first heard the word sanctification. Right out of high school, I got serious with my relationship with the Lord, and I decided, well, the best thing to do maybe would be to go work for a Christian radio station in Detroit. Well, they didn't have a place for me there, but they did have a subsidiary that was involved, at least at that point, in, in uh, installing uh, public address systems in some of the new small churches that were up and coming. Now, not knowing a whole lot as a believer, young believer really at that point, I'd been saved back in vacation Bible school and then uh, really wasn't until mid, uh, my mid, I guess, 16, 17 years old that I decided to get serious about the Lord and then after high school went to work for this group. So a lot of these churches were Assemblies of God churches. So I walked into one of them, my toolbox and everything ready to, to put in their uh, public address system. And I don't know if it was the pastor, whoever it was, came out of the office and says, Well, brother, have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? And I kind of looked at him and I, I, I assumed that he meant, Have I trusted in Christ? Was I a believer? And I said, Yes, I am. And they said, Well, have you been sanctified, brother? And I really you know, didn't know how to answer that one. So I said, well, I guess the Lord did it all for me, is, is what I ended up saying. But that's what I, that was my first, uh, the first time I'd actually heard the word sanctification. What we're going to do, and hopefully what we're going to help all of us to get started on this, is simply to look at, uh, at uh, what sanctification is all about. If you see from the diagram I've got there, we've got the point of salvation, Again, as we come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, passed from death unto life, we're made alive. But the process of sanctification is taking what we come into the Christian life with, and depending how long you were an unbeliever, you came into the Christian life with all manner of baggage, as it would be called in our day. And uh, you were, as far as God's design, to grow up as a believer. The scriptures teach us that God's plan ultimately is to conform us to the image of his son, as it states in Romans 8, 29. I know some of you have my paper in front of you, you've got a computer, others of you don't, so I'm going to probably teach off the, the, what you can all see so that you know, you're not handicapped. There'll be some quotes that I read from, from the paper that uh, you know, I think are important enough to, to read them, but pretty much we'll go with, with, the, with the pictures that you're seeing. So the overview, really, of the process of sanctification is taking us as, as, uh, as we arrive, I guess you would say, into the Christian life with viewpoint that's pretty much the world's viewpoint, uh, understanding that is pretty much uh, received by, received from, uh, we received it from unbelievers and all manner of you know, sources, 
and to turn it over into what God thinks as far as our thinking is concerned. Beyond that, based upon the thinking, is the actions that should come forth. Now, because we were, we're, for the most part, most of us here grew up in a country that at least had a foundation of Christendom in time past, and is gradually and quickly, I would say, even now moving away from that foundation, uh, we still had, we had some good ideas, at least, of what's right and what's wrong. And some of those things we brought into life with us, and if we were influenced by religion anyway, some gave us the idea, well, the more good stuff that we do, the better we're off as far as God's concerned. And if we stay away from the bad stuff, then we're, you know, we're also going to, do, going to do quite well. Well, the process of sanctification then is taking us and literally conforming us to the image of His Son. And He does that work here on the earth. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, there is a, a uh, passage when they were building the temple. And when they were building the temple, if you recall the passage, as Solomon was building that temple in, uh, in First Kings, again, all of the stones of that temple were carved out, the chisels and the hammers and all of the things that went into making those stones were done in the quarry. And then the stones were taken from that quarry and they were laid in place one by one by one without the sound of the hammer, of the chisel, or any other of the implements that the workmen might have used. And literally, that's what God is doing in the process of sanctification. He's taking, where, he's taking us where we are at, and He is literally conforming us to the image of His Son so that we, so that it might be, so that He, I should say, Jesus, might be the firstborn of many brethren, as that Romans 8.29 verse goes on to say, we being among those, those brethren. And it's done here on earth at least the major part that we're going to study as we will get into the the details of it. As we continue, again, there are three aspects of sanctification. And we're going to major on the middle one there, experiential sanctification, as we would call it. However, our sanctification begins with a position, and we'll, we'll look at those, although we're not going to major in that topic. It's the legal aspect of our sanctification where God takes us at salvation, passes us from death unto life, gives us His very own righteousness, forgives our sins, gives us eternal life, and all the other benefits that the Lord gives us at the point of salvation. Dr. Chafer named 30-plus of those benefits as he went through the Scriptures, and he has uh, enumerated them in his, in his systematic theology. Then at the end of life, you know, the final uh, goal of that sanctification is when we are taken to be with the Lord. And that's when literally the body becomes finally and fully set apart, as we shall be like Him, as the Scriptures relate. And that means at that point, at least, in in physical form and resurrection body that we're going to receive. But in between, there is that day-by-day life that is also known more popularly as the spiritual life, where the Lord takes us day-by-day, through a process that ultimately gains for us spiritual maturity. And that's really what we're going to focus our attention upon as we, as we deal with these things. Um, as we start this, it's a very important doctrine, and since this is a Chafer Theological Seminary Conference, I'm going to quote Dr. Chafer at this point because he noted its importance when he said, though, uh, though clearly stated in the Bible, no doctrine has suffered has suffered from misunderstanding and misstatement more than the doctrine of sanctification. And he had a threefold plan under which he would deal with sanctification as he started off as a man with his Bible, as is many of the cases, I might add. Uh, The interesting thing is I've grown up, again, with uh, a lot of books on my shelf to begin with. It's been 30-plus years in the ministry now. And, of course, now the new ones are all going on the computer with, with uh, uh, software like Logos, and they're all electronic. But so many of those books, again, on my shelf, when I pull them off the shelf, the ones that have become the most precious and the most meaningful, it's Dr. So-and-so DD, which means it was not an earned degree, necessarily, at least from an academic institution. It was a degree simply with a man with his Bible studying the Word of God and has come to the knowledge of the truth, which really is the, is, is the grace ministry that the Lord has given to any member, in fact, of the family of God. So as Dr. Chafer again set out to deal with the doctrine of sanctification, he related that it had to be related to all the other doctrines. It could not stand up above or by itself or and somehow be in conflict with the other doctrines. It, had to be in, it, it could not be interpreted by experience. 
He found out there in his day that there was a lot that was experiential. And so one person could say they experienced it, but the next person, try as they would, unless they were mimicking the first person, they just come, didn't come up with the experience. And unfortunately, it caused a lot of discouragement among believers, and many since then really have left the faith in those groups that, or, that uh, emphasize experience. And all the scriptures had to be covered. Again, in the sense that those things, those words, I should say, that are translated as sanctify, saint, or holy, all need to be considered. Well, as we continue down the line, let's just look at the words briefly. I realize some of you know what, you know, have an understanding of these words. You read Hebrew, and the next slide will be Greek. But these are the two major Old Testament words that are translated by, as you can see, the several translated words that we have there in the text. Holy, saint, sanctify, dedicate, consecrate, or hallowed. Kadosh or Kadesh are the two Hebrew words that uh, in various places in the Old Testament you will find several translations on those. If we jump to the New Testament, we have a series of actually five words, and they're pretty well closely related to the one at the top, Agios. Again, or Agiosmos, or Agiadzo, or Agiotes, or Agiosune. Again, those five words are translated in similar ways in the New Testament. And it's from the study of those words, the context in which they're used in, that really a biblical doctrine of sanctification can be derived. Translated as sanctify, or holiness, saint, or hallowed are the uh, the various translations as we look at those words. So that leads us again, and skipping a lot of stuff here for the moment, but that leads us to a working definition that I'm going to give you of sanctification. It means basically be set apart for the service of God, That's its primary meaning as you look at both the Old Testament Hebrew words and the New Testament Greek words, set apart for the service of God, and also set apart from that which is not associated with God. So we have onto and apart from, you see, is the idea of that working definition. Now, many would relate it to sin. I suspect that the fellow that uh, talked to me when I was putting a PA system in their church was thinking about Have I been liberated from sin? And it's not inherently related to sin. And the reason is because of a couple of passages, and I suspect there's more if uh, you took the time to study them, because the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless, and yet He would grow to be sanctified in His humanity, as the Scriptures relate. So as we look at it with with, with an eye on uh, on the first two paragraphs there, the third paragraph, sanctification for the Christian, is a theological term describing the believer in relationship to sin, now specifically for us now, to sin, uh, over three phases, and then we've listed them as you saw them in the earlier diagram. Positionally freed from the penalty of sin, experientially, the one we're going to be dealing with, freed from the power of sin, and then ultimately freed from the presence of sin is where our working definition goes. Now we might also ask the question, why is it important? Well, it really answers the question, what happens after salvation. You know, the emphasis of salvation is the cross of Christ. After salvation, what? You know, some would say, well, we do good works and good deeds and we try to keep our nose clean and whatever else, you know, what what happens after salvation? Well, that's really, you know, the bottom line of what sanctification answers. What does happen after salvation? How does the Christian life proceed? How do we deal with sin? I mean, there are one model, as we'll, we'll note it, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but one model, again, the, notes the fact that when you, uh, after salvation, you have a second experience that removes that sin nature from you. And so you don't have to worry about sin anymore. At least that's what they say. How does the babe in Christ, then we all come into the Christian life, you know, depending on what type of home you grew up in. I realize some of you here might be what has been called cradle Christians. You had a head start on most of us if you had a a good uh, uh, home where parents taught you from the Word of God and took you to a Bible-believing church where the Word of God was taught. Again, uh, if if you started there, again, then you're ahead of us. But for the rest, which I did not, by the way, start in that situation. I grew up in an unbelieving home uh, until later on, and my dad trusted in Christ on his deathbed. My mom later on, and still alive, I might add. Um, How do we reach spiritual maturity? How do we grow up as believers? Well, again, those are the questions that are answered by our study. 
as we're going to look at this, this overview. Now, why is it important would be the next question we would ask. Well, a faulty view of sanctification, again, hinders or stunts your spiritual growth as, as we uh, see the examples. Most of these many times are experiential. If you've got this subjective mysticism, and one of our speakers is going to cover, again, mysticism and how it fits into the whole picture. Mark is going to cover that one, Mark Perkins, uh, dealing with sanctification. It's the idea that I've had an experience, and if you don't have my experience, then somehow you're less than me. You just haven't quite made it in the program and plan of God. Well, again, that, that messes people up. And at least in my own pastoral experience, I've seen people just walk away from Christ because they can't make it as far as they believe because of a faulty view of the mystic side of sanctification that some propose. Uh, some think, as I already mentioned, the removal of the sin nature, and the idea there, by the way, is that God has to remove your sin nature so you can live a godly life. And you, without the removal of sin nature, you can't live that godly life. And then we got the group that basically thinks that it's just the good works, you know, before sa- they may have the sal- sanct- uh, salvation right in that you don't work for salvation, but after salvation, that's the way you grow by doing good works, doing good deeds, you know, just lining up and stacking one on top of the other, all the good works that uh, may be available, made available to you. Or there's the experiential empowerment where God touches the believer. This is a big one in our day. Some of them get glued to the floor. Some of them speak in other languages. Some of them bark and laugh uncontrollably or run up and down the aisles because they have been touched by the Holy Spirit. And that means they've got some special sanctification, that some special set-apartness you see unto God. And again, that, that jumps us back to the mystical side because, well, I don't have that, another person will say, and I don't feel that way. Is, is, is there something wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And unfortunately, so many times the answer is, well, you just don't have enough faith or just, you know, those types of things. And that's the sad part of of getting into a wrong view or a wrong understanding of sanctification. Well, um, now, (laughs) Robbie listed nine. When I was talking to him, he gave me eight. Because uh, I had uh, I had seven of them down. I didn't have the, the what he gave me as the eighth, and I guess he's found one since. So he may share that with you himself in the evening classes. But I've got eight of them here, and I've listed them for you: the contemplative mystical model, the sacramental model, Lutheran model, Reform model, Wesleyan holiness, the Keswick Victorian life, life model, and the Augustinian dispensational model, which is also known as the Chafferian model, and that's the one we at Chafer Theological Seminary, uh, again, uphold. And hopefully, again, uh, if you're not of that persuasion, you'll gain some understanding in our conference uh, this week. And then the Pentecostal model, of which there are all over the board varieties, but we'll we'll get into that as we we continue on. Let's start with the first two, though, because we're going to just, you know, basically move them off the, you know, off of our study, because just to give you an idea, both of these are Roman Catholic models, and they're not going to be addressed in this study. I mean, you probably know the sacerdotal, sacerdotal model, again, in that, you know, this has to do with going through the seven sacraments of the Roman church, and uh, unless you are going to take orders, you know, like become a nun or a priest or something like that, that's one of them, or uh, last rites, you get to see that oftentimes displayed on, in TV and movies and so on when they have to call the priest before the guy dies. Those are, you know, that's part of that model. And it's, again, basically a, a pretty much a work system, the, the contemplative mystical adds that mystery aspect into it. But we're not going to deal much with that except just to mention it. It's the first two of of our listing here. The Lutheran model. We'll say a little bit more about that because when you study the the Lutheran model, basically the Holy Spirit brings us to faith and then kind of makes us holy. It's kind of synonymous with their view of justification. It's part of salvation. So if God saved you, he's going to take you all the way there is kind of the idea. And so it's simply an extension, really, of justification and not really answering any questions for believers struggling in the Lutheran church. And that's, unfortunately, knowing, in fact, having some Lutheran uh, portions of my family coming from, you know, Schmipp-Liker, German, Martin Luther, Germany. um, Again, I see that experientially in their lives. They basically, you know, just, well, you know, I'm I'm a Christian and I'm just going to get there. You know, that's kind of the idea. And their sanctification model displays that in reality. Go to church and and do what they tell you to do and and all the rest of it. And you're, you're okay. I mean, that's kind of the thought there. Now, what we're doing at this point, from this point on, 
we're going to look very briefly to begin with at each model just to give you a quick overview of it and then we'll get into more detail when we deal with some of the uh, distinctive features as we as we run through this but let me start with the reform model there and again now we're dealing at this point with uh, the pretty much the experiential side, the middle, you know, as we drew the diagram, posi- positional and experiential and ultimate over here for you folks. Experiential sanctification is guaranteed by the sovereign of God, sovereignty of God. Now, again, in the reform view, the, the sovereignty of God is the big issue. I mean, they have the, the five-point mnemonic of TULIP, and if you're one of the elect, then you truly are elected to be sanctified. And so it is pretty much guaranteed is the idea. But there is a there is a level of cooperation that you have, you know, that you are, you know, that you will walk with God. But if you don't cooperate enough, then unfortunately in the in the extremes of that reform view, then you don't even have assurance of your salvation because if you really drop out, then you probably weren't elect to begin with, is almost the direction it goes. But that's kind of the overview of that model. God gradually removes that sin nature from you and the tendency for sin is replaced by the doing of righteousness is, is kind of a quick overview of the reform model as you look at it. And we come to the Wesleyan, Holy, the Wesleyan Holiness model. This again stems back to Charles Wesley. After salvation, again, was taught there, you know, salvation's the first step, but after there comes a second crisis point in your life when you realize, you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm saved, but, you know, what's next? Nothing's happening in my life. It's not working. And so God grants, again, in their view, a second work of grace where the problem is you've got a sin nature and that sin nature needs to be removed. That's their thinking. And so the removal of the sin nature is the thing that, in their view, makes holy living possible. Now, Charles Wesley himself did not go that far. It's, it was the followers of Wesley that actually took this model into the, the, the depths, I guess I would call it, of sinless perfection. And we uh, will just briefly look at, for the moment, the uh, Keswick Victorious Life View. And this again was, this is the one that, by the way, Chafer is so oftentimes confused with. But really it's, it's an attempt, initially it was an attempt for uh, those believers who were also feeling, and I, I, I use feeling not so much in the emotional sense, but really seeing in their lives that there was, the holiness that they wanted to attain was simply not there. And so something wasn't working as they saw their Christian life. And so the emphasis then was to receive this act of sanctification by entirely consecrating yourself to God. And I think they misuse, and Dr. Chafer, as well as the Dallas Seminary professors and the, for, uh, the president, Wal- the, uh, Ch- uh, Dr. Walbert, that followed Chafer, uh, have made note of that consecration is not really something that man can do. It's something that God does for us. But that's, that's the view where you kind of let go of... I've been trying to do this. I'm living my life on my own power. I need to surrender myself onto the Lord God. And the end result of that surrender will be that God takes over. And with God taking over, I can be victorious. That, in essence, is the view. It's like salvation, though. It is a second act. And the the detail of that act is the act of this entire consecration. It's a let go, let God thing that they're thinking of. Now, that's, and the reason it's, con, it's confused with the Chaferian view is basically because Dr. Chafer also noted the fact that there was a point at which, and we're going to look at that, a point at which the believer kind of makes up his mind that he's going to you know, continue in Scripture, I guess is what I'll call it, continue in the biblical principles and precepts of what the Bible lays out as the Christian life after salvation. That takes us, in fact, let me just put that up here to the Chaferian model. Also known by, what this is what Dr. Walvard coined, the Augustinian. He tied it back to Augustine. The, the basic reason for that, because of Augustine's extensive writing on the realization he had a sin nature. And he had a sin nature after salvation. And so, uh, again, uh, and a full-blown sin nature was the thought. Well, at salvation, again, the believer received a new nature. And uh, this is denied by some of the other views, I might add. That there is, that, well, no, let me back up from it. I don't want to misstate that. 
that, there, that the old nature and the new nature are, there's two natures within the new believer. You know, the old man and the new man type thinking. And as the believer determines then to live by the new nature, he can deal with sin. The sins, outright sins in his life that are basically the grieving of the spirit. And the sins where he chooses not to allow the spirit to lead him, so he quenches the spirit, they're handled by confession. And growth takes place as the believer submits himself to the Lord to walk in the Spirit, or as, in fact, Robbie's going to be teaching in the evening sessions, to abide in Christ, that uh, wonderful passage from the Gospel of John. But that's quick overview, then. That's all we're doing right now. We're going to give more detail in, in a moment as we continue on. The Pentecostal model, varied, as I would say. Uh, classic Pentecostalism tends toward the Wesleyan holiness view. Second work of grace with tongues, though. That's how you know it happened, because you speak in other languages. And some groups take it very far that if you haven't spoken in tongues, then you really haven't had that second work of grace. Others are becoming more moderate in, uh, currently. Uh, and that's the second point there. The other branches tend toward the Keswick Victorious Life model in that they try to, in the idea of surrendering yourself unto God, to crucify that sin nature, to kill that thing is, is kind of the idea, and uh, thereby uh, live unto the Lord. And, of course, it's a constant process of something really that, that they're asking their parishioners that's impossibility to crucify the sin nature. It's there. We've got it until the Lord takes us from this sin nature ridden body to be with himself and gives us that brand, if we're, and if we're alive at the time, gives us that brand new resurrection body as, as spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, the assemblies of God, now they're probably the most stable at this point. And you, you know, most of us, I think, could probably work with them at some level. We have a big Assemblies of God college up in the Seattle area, um, Northwest University, which is not to be associated with the other one, the big one. Uh, and, uh, and we've had some, you know, dealings with them, and you know, they, can, they realize, you know, some of the errors of, of the direction. There's some gradual change taking place there, but they do see a threefold sanctification, but they still confuse the baptism of the Spirit with the speaking in tongues, and they also include that, with the filling of the Spirit, I should say, and also include, again, the speaking in tongues as far as their, their view is concerned. Well, let's turn to the critical issues in sanctification. The number one critical issue, again, is the one that would divide the uh, Wesleyan holiness group as well as the Pentecostal holiness group from the rest of the models of, of uh, sanctification. And that is what you see from the diagram, the fact that there is a second work of grace whereby you are made perfect. And so sanctification then is that point of being made perfect and thereby free to be holy is, is their view. Um, the instantaneous removal of the sin nature. Now their belief again in the instantaneous removal of the sin nature. Let me, let me just, here's a quote I'm going to give you. This is from Adam Clark. Those of you who have uh, any Bible study program on your computer, you will get a public domain commentary set among them, by Adam Clark. Well, Adam Clark was a proponent of uh, Wesleyan holiness type sanctification. And here's what he says. In no part of the scriptures are we, directed, are we directed to seek holiness. And then he uses a Latin term, which I'm just going to translate for you, step by step or gradually. We are to come to God as well for an instantaneous and complete purification from all sin as for an instantaneous pardon. Neither the, and he uses seratim there, the in a series, in series pardon, nor the step-by-step -step gradual purification exists in the Bible. It is when the soul is purified from all sin that it can properly grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the field may be expected to produce a good crop and all the seed vegetate, when the thorns and the thistles and the briars and the noxious weeds of every kind are grubbed out of it. Now that's his belief. You take all the bad stuff out, it's in nature and all that's associated with it, and then you can live a holy life. And So just know that, by the way, as you, as you read Adam Clark, if uh, you use that commentary in, uh, in part of your study, because he comes from that, that position. And... Uh, it's the major issue, as I said, so I put it the number one critical issue, to divide, really, sanctification between the other views, as we're going to see, which is pretty much all threefold, and, again, the holiness view, Wesleyan holiness, 
or the Pentecostals that tend toward that direction of, the holy, of, of holiness groups. Okay, the rest of them, again, uh, look at it as a multiple event, I should say a sanctification as a multiplicity in the Bible. As we already had this slide up here, again, it's a repeat, but it is in three stages. Positionally, as you see, where the believer is permanently freed, uh, where the believer is permanently freed from the penalty of sin. In other words, your sins are all forgiven. The good news of the gospel is that your sins are paid for. That's the bottom line. Nobody goes to hell to pay for their sins. Jesus did that on the cross. In fact, as the Bible is very clear, the only reason a person goes to hell is because of rejecting the solution for our salvation, which is Jesus Christ. You know, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Life or hell based on Christ. So the legal aspect is what God does at that moment of salvation when we put our faith and trust in him. And then, again, the experiential side is we're, we're going to note that in, in more detail as we go along. Again, glorification is the, is the ultimate stage of sanctification. And uh, all of the groups, again... Uh, all the other models, I should say, uh, that we have looked at. And again, now we're leaving off the Roman Catholic model, Lutheran model, but all the rest of them and the other five, and that's what we're going to be studying really in a little more detail. Uh, apart from the holiness groups, Wesleyan holiness groups, pretty much accept a threefold sanctification, seeing something that takes place at the point of our salvation or justification, and then ultimately you know, fin- finished at the end. Pretty much they all believe that we're never fully sanctified by the time we reach the end of our life. You know, we're taken up to be with the Lord and and fully and completely, you know, purified at that point in time, which is the the goal of ultimate sanctification. Some of them might say uh, that, you know, as far as our, uh, you know, they just may limit it to the body and the fact you can become in mind and spirit and so on fully sanctified, but, you know, they, they tend toward the Pentecostal, groups that, that tend to do that. Um, there is, again, this, uh, this aspect of ultimate sanctification. And let's say, I wanted to say something else here. Oh, let me note the fact that the Reformed theologians like to use the term uh, definite sanctification instead of ultimate, excuse me, instead of positional sanctification. And by that, what they're doing, again, is another definition to, to think about. We call it positional, but the reform groups like to call it definite sanctification because the reason, again, is that they include in there the idea that there will be, uh, that you are at the point of, of, of salvation when you receive positional or definite sanctification. You also, again, are not going to be able to fall into deep, deep sin is the idea. You're definitely set apart in the sense that um, there won't be any deep, deep sin. And of course, they would, to logically draw that to its end conclusion, if you do, then you probably weren't elect to begin with, you probably weren't saved. And unfortunately, the fact about those on that extreme, they really never have any security when it comes right down to their, their salvation. You know, growing up in the Detroit area, we had a lot of people, Grand Rapids is not too far from Detroit, it is a strong area of Calvinism, and I heard lots of horror stories in, in my early days back in Detroit about elderly people who were on their deathbed thinking that they had done something, that, and they really weren't saved, they really weren't part of the elect. And that's kind of a sad situation as, as you see it, how it gets worked out. Well, again, uh, I think I, I, as we note the... Issues in positional ultimate sanctification. Let's, let's take those two ends for a moment. What issues are there? Well, again, the, uh, they all agree pretty much. Reformed, Keswick, Pentecostal, that's Assemblies of God now. The AOG stands for Assemblies of God there and Chafirian. And then the terminology differences, and that's what I just noted. I didn't realize I had the slide up here for it, but you can see what we, we talked about. The difference between definite, sanct- definitive excuse me, sanctification and uh, positional sanctification. And that includes death to the dominion of sin. The truly saved cannot continue in sin as a dominant way of life. And ongoing carnality is impossible. And again, for those of you who may know little about the Reformed position, they do not believe in an ongoing carnality. Again, they do not see that as possibility in an ongoing carnality. And they address that by their definitive sanctification definition or the changing of the term from positional to definitive. Okay, six issues when it comes to experiential salvation. 
six issues, six critical issues that we're going to look at next. The third one will be the main one when we get to it, and we'll diagram several of these for you. And if you, if you don't get the quick overview, hopefully the diagrams, for those of you more visually oriented, the, the diagrams will help out. But the first one is the labeling issue because, again, there is a difference. Uh, some label, as we do, experiential. Uh, the reform group calls it progressive sanctification. There's, there's a reason for that, as we'll note. The second is the relationship between justification and sanctification. That pretty much, you know, as far as the three views, I should say the three aspects of sanctification, that's pretty much self, you know, um, understood. And then the relationship to uh, sovereignty, the sovereignty of God versus the human involvement. That's where there are some major differences, as we're going to see. As well as in number four, the either one is the believer of one nature or two natures. Well, we're going to see that as well. And then the role of the Holy Spirit and the mechanics. You know, what, what do these models give you as far as what, what's, what part does the Holy Spirit play in this? And, and, and how do we? The Bible says walk in the Spirit, literally walk by the Spirit would be a proper translation of the, of the preposition there. And then the means of victory in each one of these models as far as the Christian life is, is concerned. So let's start with the, with the labeling issue here. Again, as we look at the labeling issue, as far as experiential or progressive, it's difference really between the reform model and the other three. The reform model uh, likes the label progressive because it's always an onward-upward trek. You know, as long as you're, you're cooperating with God, is their term, then you are going to be onward and upward, and you're not going to fall backwards, by and large. The other three models of Chepharian, Keswick, and the Assembly of God version of the Pentecostal model are quite comfortable using experiential sanctification as the, as the definition for that middle aspect of sanctification, that middle phase. Because what it does, because what it allows for is carnality. It allows for a lack of progress as far as the believer is concerned. And so it does become a, you know, a real issue only between Reformed and the, and the other models of sanctification. The second issue is the relationship between justification and sanctification. And as you can see from the diagram there, the Reformed and Chafirian and Pentecostal models, and this is uh, Assembly of God, should have put AOG there, models, they all see justification and positional or definitive sanctification occurring at the point of salvation. You know, God does set us apart in a unique way eternally. You know, placed into union with Christ, or as Dr. Chafer pointed out, the 30-plus things that he listed in his systematic theology that are received uh, by grace. We do nothing in, in any way. Uh, they are part of the package, the salvation package that God brings to us. Now, when you get down to the Keswick or Victorian life model, victorious life model, or the Wesleyan holiest model, or the Pentecostals that lean in that direction, they've got, as you can see from that diagram, two things that are going on. They've got salvation and then some type of second work of grace that, you know, that sanctification is. So it is, you know, justification just saves you. That's all it does. And they really, you know, in, in the details, there's not a whole lot of definition as far as all that's received which is where Dr. Chafer was unique in, in going through, you know, a man in his Bible, going through that Bible and just picking out, you know, the things that we gain. That's, uh, again, translated from the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of his dear son, given five ministries of the Holy Spirit and all those other things that, that uh, again, Dr. Chafer lists in his systematic theology. Just a, a, a tremendous study in itself as well as something to present to your congregation. But the Wesleyan holiness or Keswick view, you know, they have to have that second thing before any, any real Christian activity, spiritual growth takes place as far as their, their view of the relationship between justification and sanctification. Okay, the relationship now of sovereignty to human decisions, that we're talking the sovereignty of God there, and human involvement. Now again, as we would look at all of them together, the Reformed, the Chafarian, and the Pentecostal all see a sharing, but it's the level of sharing that, that's involved between God and man. As you can well imagine, on the Reformed side, the, the sharing is pretty much all God. He does the most of it, and man simply has to, and their terminology is, cooperate. And I, you know, I, I, was, I read some things from R.C. Sproul and and some of the more, and MacArthur, some of the more popular authors, and they, they really don't have, at least as I discovered, not much, dis, you know, not much definition of that uh, cooperating with God type of thing in, in a very 
a unique, mechanical, technical way, as, as I think the scriptures spell out for us. But there, there is a relationship, you know, they, there is agreement with that, I guess we would say. Now, the diagrams I'm going to show you are not my, well, again, they are my own, but they're based upon. They're, they're, they're based upon Charles Ryrie's di- uh, diagrams that are found in his book, Balancing the Christian Life. So, and this just gives you a general idea. The, uh, the vertical axis is the growth axis, and then the horizontal, as you can see, is the timeline axis from salvation, as we look at the various models of, of sanctification as, as we might diagram them. So as we, as we move down the list of those things, let me take a moment to start with the reform model. Now again, as I, and the basic issue, I probably should have redesigned the slide to tell you the truth, but the basic issue is uh, where, we, where we, li- we list the, the model that you find there. Reform model, more emphasis on sovereignty than human, invo- human involvement. And uh, again, Charles Hodge would probably be a uh, good one to quote, and let me just quote for what, what Hodge has said. There's a cooperation between man and the divine nature, and Charles Hodge being a noted uh, Reformed theologian. Sanctification is declared to be the work of God's free grace. Two things are included in this. First, that the power or influence by which it is carried on is supernatural. And secondly, that granting this influence to any sinner, to one sinner rather than another, or to one more than another, is a matter of favor. In other words, it's all in the hands of God, how that works. So God's major involvement, who gets more or less, it, as Zodge would say, is, seems to be what he's saying there. B.B. Warfield, theologian of, uh, well, it's, I was going to say last generation, but I think it's a little farther back than that. Uh, Dr. Ryrie actually points out something in, in one of his uh, volumes where... Um, He's quoting in, uh, in uh, quoting, uh, yeah, Warfield. I don't want to get my names mixed up here. Quoting Warfield, that pretty much what, uh, what his belief of that was, it's kind of an irresistible sovereignty. And he uses the simple quote there that a good tree, a true believer, will produce good fruit. And so, in other words, God is totally the one who sees to it that you're going from, you know, pre, just post salvation up to being conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, irresistibly is the idea, almost like, you know, the salvation call of the Lord is an irresistible grace. So we get an idea of the reform model. Now, if we want to look at a diagram, how that might be diagrammed, it looks something like this. You start off at salvation. There may be, there's a gradual upward growth with ups and downs until death. And pretty much the ups and downs are dealing with their, you know, their, and I don't really know, I really don't know, I can give you a solid definition. Probably the, those who are dealing, the speakers after me are dealing with more details may have some better information on that. But, uh, you know, my, my task was just to overview everything for you. And as you see, it's, a, you know, the gradual upward trend by the sovereignty of God is the typical reform model. And what that means is that as, as the believer cooperates, quote-unquote, with God, the sin nature is, is, becomes less and less, they use the term mortified, extirpated is another term that we're going to note in a moment, and the spiritual life increases, holy living increases in the reform model. How that all happens, what the believer does day by day, you see, that's where they fall woefully short in spiritual growth, in the spiritual life. Let's jump to the Chafarian model. Now we got, I'm going to give you three renditions of it as we'll look at it. This was, again, the, uh, the model by Lewis Berry Chafer. The believer participates, but sanctification is not inevitable. Now we're dealing with experiential. Now keep in mind the middle ground here. Uh, positionally, well, from your side, positionally, again, God has given you, and you can't lose that salvation, one of those things that you receive is eternal security. Once saved, always saved, because God did it. It was totally His work. Man had nothing whatsoever to do with it at all. And again, ultimately, the Lord's going to take you to be with Himself. And that may be in a wonderful way at the end of a fantastic life, or it may be by, by death, in the sin on the death. But nevertheless, it's going to happen, uh, and that's guaranteed by, by the Lord. But so, so the middle ground, the experiential sanctification in, in the Chafer view is not inevitable. It begins with a step where the believer responds to the beseeching of the Lord to begin their reasonable service. Now, this is where there's a dividing line I'm going to note because, also, because what Chafer wrote and what I've heard him say 
Uh, Robbie has some of Chafer's lectures as well as I, and some of you may have the Sam Littlepage CD where Chafer gives his spiritual life lectures. If, if not, I think it's still available out there. Uh, when you listen to what Dr. Chafer said, it's not quite what, you know, that, I think that's why it's confused with the Keswick view, but we'll, we'll note in the diagram in just a moment. It begins with a step where the believer responds to the beseeching of the Lord to begin their reasonable service and the believer at that point agrees to the, submit themselves to the authority of God. Here's my diagram of it. Salvation, and then that, that upward red arrow where you've got an initial response. It's kind of like you know, when we decide, you know, you, it, it's like a, for those of us who are husbands and, and the wife has told us, you know, this just needs to be done. You know, go clean the garage. Let's use that. Go clean the garage. This needs to be done. And we just look at it day by day and that garage just gets full of more, more and more junk and more and more stuff. And then finally one day we decide, I'm going to clean the garage. That's, that's what I see as the Chifurian view. I'm going to start down that road to obey God. And, uh, and Walverd and Ryrie made it more of a one-shot dedication in the sense that you know, it's a, and you've probably all heard it in, in many of our, our uh, Dallas Seminary churches. You know, you start with salvation, and then the second stage, you make him Lord. Make, you know, you get saved, and then you make him Lord of your life. That, that, that's the idea. I don't think Dr. Chafer, you know, had that in mind. He had more in mind this was a starting point that, that you know, when it, when it all begins, as far as uh, the Chaferian model is concerned. Uh, in, uh, in the picture. And I'm looking for a quote here. Um, well, that's not until we get to another slide. Let me jump ahead to the, to the Walverd Ryrie view of it. Uh, the view of uh, Charles Ryrie and uh, um, John Walverd both established a beginning point of dedication. You know, this is, and they basically, ba- and they base it on the uh, Romans 12. Present your body as a living sacrifice, which is, in fact, an aorist tense. And they take it as just a one point in time. Could be taken as a constant of aorist, which some do. But they take a series of points when you decide every time that this needs to be done and wrap it up into one, you know, it's an idea of you're, you're started down that road, you can continue down that road. Um, but they established that beginning point. So if you look at their diagram, you know, we basically changed the, the lettering. Nothing else has changed except the lettering on the upward red arrow. It's a point of dedication. And then you've got upwards climb and the continued fight. There's two natures involved there, as you saw from the rest of the diagram, the old nature versus the new nature. And um, again, you're either spiritual or... Well, well, again, there's a confusion. I know when I went to seminary, you know, there was a confusion between being filled with the Spirit and spirituality. I remember running into that time and time again because you were more spiritual or less spiritual rather than more mature, less mature. And um, again, uh, that was kind of how, they, how it took. You know, you kind of go along for a while and you decide, well, things aren't going right. I must be, I must, must be living in sin or something. And that's when you took a moment to confess the sin and hopefully uh, you know, acknowledge you were grieving the Spirit or you weren't being led by the Spirit. And it was uh, more of an ongoing, drawn-out type of affair, at least as I, I experienced it uh, going to school there at the seminary. Um, but it is main, you know, again, empowerment is maintained by walking in the Spirit and dealing with the sin nature. Now let me look, let me give you a modified. Well, let me uh, let me see what I wanted to say of that. Now that, I'm going to say something about the modified view in just a moment. A couple quotes: the modified Chafurian view. There is the idea of an absolute spirituality. Either you are filled with the Spirit or you are not. Growth happens as you are filled with the Spirit, and the believer sins by either grieving the Spirit, you know, choosing. I mean, he, when he sins, he does grieve the Spirit, or he sins by uh, quenching in the sense of not following the leading, the guiding of the Spirit. And that can be restored by confession. Now, if we diagram this one, this is my own diagram, but if we diagram it, you can see from the diagram, from the black lines, you start off at the point of salvation, there's a little bit of growth. You know, you were saved, you realize maybe they gave you some insur- assurance, whatever it is, but that's where your growth started. The first time you sinned, you got out of fellowship. Now, being that I'm a pastor of a Baptist church, I had to slip in an old Baptist term there, that black, that black box of backsliding. Well, that can happen if you're out of fellowship long enough. You will go backwards. You will backslide. And uh, so I put it there. Uh, and the way you get back up is acknowledge your confessing a sin, 
as you see from the, from the diagram. And then you, there's growth that can take place as you do that. And so on. You see the up and down thing. But what you see with this diagram is that spirituality is absolute. Growth only takes place. Major growth, I guess we'll call it, takes place as... And I mean, there is growth when you're out of fellowship because you really learn, you know, just like we all, when we all got spanked, we, we learned not do that again. You know, that's kind of... So there is some growth that occurs, um, but not necessarily, you know, the positive growth. Well, I guess it would be positive. Uh, Hebrews 12 says it's positive, you know, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But the spiritual growth again takes place by and large as we are under the controlling, filling of the Holy Spirit or walking by means of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Uh, That would be what I'd call the absolute, uh, and I should say the the modified Chifferian model. Let me read you a couple of things based on on this, this, is, uh, this comes from uh, the uh, Bibsack Journal from a writer named George Cowan. Uh, and what he's talking about, together with Romans 12.1, he's talking about you know, Romans 12.1 and the other verses that speak about our spiritual lives. Consequently, consequently after Romans 12.1, the responsibility falls upon him, the believer, of seeing to it that this life of yieldedness, in other words, continued submission to God is the thought there, Uh, continued unbroken responsibility, which is stressed by the use of the present tenses in the commands, be walking in the Spirit, be continually filled with the Spirit. And he's using Ephesians 5.16 and uh, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 5.18, Galatians 5.16. The believer's life will be marred, fellowship broken, and the Spirit's ministry hindered by the slightest failure fully and always to cooperate. To even the most spiritual of believers, therefore, comes the warning, come the warning prohibitions of grace. And then he's got the two, grieve not the spirit or quench not the spirit. Also writing on this same level, Dr. Walvard, again in another article in uh, Bibsack, noted the fact of the priesthood of the believer. It was an article that he wrote on the priesthood of the believer. And he talks about the sacrifices of the believer. And he talks about the fact that you know, every believer is a priest, and the first of these sacrifices is, and then he goes to Romans 12, when the living sacrifice. But simply basing, you know, basing the, uh, his analogy on the Old Testament system of sacrifices, there was no sacrifice that I found in the Old Testament that was only offered once. It was an ongoing, sometimes day-by-day thing. As you, as you sin and uh, get yourself out of fellowship, you... Again, the idea is acknowledging that sin and getting back in the, the, abide, the, the sphere of abiding in Christ or walking by means of the Spirit. So we see the, what I would call, again, a modified Jeffurian model there. Okay, Wesleyan holiness model. This is the second work of entire sanctification. By the way, that's the term that they use. You want some definitions. That's the term that is used, entire sanctification, where God remedies the uh, systematic sinfulness by removing the sin nature. It's gone. It's out of there is the idea. And we got a quote here from one of the proponents of uh, the Wesleyan holiest model, uh, Emmy Dieter. Entire sanctification is a personal, definitive work of God, sanct- uh, God's sanctifying grace, by which the war within oneself might cease and the heart be fully released from rebellion into wholehearted love for God and others. Now, by the way, he is using pretty much at the end of that, uh, Charles Wesley's, that's about as far as he went, that the, the, the sin was removed to the extent that you could exercise a wholehearted love for God. Those that followed him moved it farther into the thought and the thinking that you became completely sinless. Well, keep that, do keep that in mind. Okay, his view right here at this point. As you see diagrammed, uh, you go along right after salvation, realize things aren't quite going the way you thought they should be as a believer in Christ. So you need that second work of grace. Somebody talks you into it. The fact you need to get sanctified, brother. And uh, what that means is on that second crisis act, it's a, it's a similar act in their view as, as was salvation, a work of God that comes upon you. And the sin nature is, is gone. It's removed. And thereby you are able, as you see, to live uh, and enter into a sinless, perfected life. And it, that's why they call it entire sanctification. You're completely, you know, again, if we use the biblical model, being conformed to the image of Christ, you know, who are you? Well, I wouldn't say you would be, to tell you the truth. Okay, let's look at 
the relationship of sovereignty to, oh, no, excuse me, no, that's what we're looking at. Let me get down to the Pentecostal, I guess I didn't cover this one. The Pentecostal holiness model, which is pretty much the same as the, as the Wesleyan model. Second work of grace, baptism of the Spirit, received after salvation. It's accompanied by tongues for the most part in most of these groups. Uh, that's the sign that it happens. See, they have to, they have to experientially know something really happened. They have a real problem with, unfortunately, so many in experiential Christianity today day have a real problem with faith, simply because God said it, that's why it happened. Not because I was glued to the floor or I spoke in, in, in well, usually it's gibberish, not even foreign languages. Um, the believer then, sin nature is removed. Divine empowerment for Christian living is received from the Holy Spirit. And here again, the only difference between this and the earlier diagram is it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's another second work of grace. And it is, for the most part, accompanied by an experience of some sort. And tongues has been the main one, although others are you know, in the forefront. And the idea that you're living in the baptism of the Spirit, this is where the um, other experiences enter the picture, you know, you know, the idea of being slain in the Spirit, you know, and so on. And, um, I once had it, when we were in the Midwest Iowa church, the, there was a church split of a huge charismatic church in the town about 15 miles to the west of us. Marshalltown was the name of the town. And since our church was kind of generically named Grace Believers Church, they didn't know what we were to begin with. And so we had uh, three families that started coming to, to our church there. It wasn't, wasn't a big church, but they started coming to our church. And, and, and doing what I do, I was in the middle of a passage that said nothing about tongues, nothing about... So I didn't teach anything about tongues for quite a while. Till we, you know, I believe that you know, this, they brought them here. The Lord, this is the passage the Lord has given, the book the Lord has given. So I'm not going to step out of, you know, because you need to hear this, you need to hear that type, type of thing. It's a good lesson to learn for all of you guys as pastors, you know. Don't step out of what the Lord's guiding and directing you in. Well, lo and behold, when we finally got to a passage that talked about this type of stuff, and I was kind of dreading actually giving that uh, message because I thought I'm going to lose these people at this point probably. But nevertheless, it was there. I had to say it. And, and this guy came up to me afterwards, and I thought, uh-oh, here it comes. And he, and he said to me, you know, you know what I used to be back in the other church? I was a catcher. I looked at him, it was kind of funny, what's a catcher? So you know, when, when, the, when the evangelist hits the person on the head, I catch him, I'm the guy behind. But he stayed, you know, that was kind of the neat thing. He, you know, they, he, uh, he had learned enough of God's word, put it under his belt, that he realized that, you know, that, that stuff, you know, all of a sudden it clicked, you know, why would I have to catch him, you know, if God was in this? Anyway, kind of neat. Okay, Keswick, victorious life, victorious life model. Again, again, it's entirely the work of God. Uh, the believer surrenders entirely to God in this let go, uh, let God type of decision that's made. And again, as, as Charles Ryrie writes on this, he says of the Keswick model, the believer receives sanctification by faith through a crisis act of entire consecration. They use that term consecration to God. Uh, which we see here, kind of a let go, let God, and there may be some rocky road to begin with. That's what those, those little squiggly arrows refer to. But the idea is after you've let go, and there's still, you know, you're still holding on to some remnants. Is that, that's what the, those arrows are trying to depict. They're holding on to some remnants. But as you totally let go of all these areas of your life, then God is finally able to use you because it's His power through you, supposedly, that is accomplishing these things. And, you know, in essence, it's leaving out a lot of our human choices when you come right down to it uh, in, that, in that Keswick view. Pentecostal model, uh, this is the Assemblies of God now. We gave you the holiness model earlier. This is the Assemblies of God of the Pentecostal model. So I've labeled it 3A, three, three I guess, there. Um, again, uh, it is uh, positionally and ultimate. Well, I always said that. Uh, the experiential sanctification is to them a cooperative effort. Uh, TJ, T.P. Jenny, again, is one of their writers, uh, and I've got, uh, I guess it's their, the, the book, that, the theology book, actually, that Northwest College uses when they teach uh, Assemblies of God Theology by Stan Horton is the, is the author of that book, and so that's where, I, that's where I'm picking up this information from. It's their, the, their you know, their, the equivalent of, of Schaefer's Systematic Theology. Uh, the, I guess it's the main theology book, that, that's the one they use there. Christian, uh, Christians choose to be sanctified by the Spirit, a process that requires each individual's continuing cooperation. That's pretty much the statement that he makes there 
Uh, but, but we've got kind of the idea of once you're baptized in the Spirit, there is a concept, did you see, the upward track of living in the power of the Spirit. And this is where they get, understand something of carnality. And uh, uh, again, but their, their initial act of being you know, baptized by the Spirit is the thing that gives them their empowerment. And as they continue to walk with the Lord, and the, the downward arrows again point to the times when they're not, uh, and they do have to get, you know, do have, do have to acknowledge sin and get right with the Lord. So you can see they're kind of close, you know, as far as what I believe the more biblical view of sanctification is. Of course, the Jeffurian view. Um, okay, now critical issues in experiential sanctification. Two natures issues. What we're dealing with now in this fourth point. Here's the reform model visualized for you. Again, it's it's kind of like a. Uh, in one of those, uh, what was that movie uh, that where, the, where the aliens plant the seed in you and then it grows and you finally pops out of your chest? Well, in essence, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that, but anyway. <laughs> new life is infused in, in the new believer and it kind of grows. You can see the second diagram as this new life grows within. You know, there's no two natures. It's the old nature kind of being taken over, being, you know, like Pac-Man being gobbled up by the new nature is kind of the thing, or being gobbled up by the new life. And so gradually the old nature is, and their term there is extirpated uh, for a definition point. Now I think Robbie said he gave uh, a list of definitions in the packets that you should have received. I didn't look to see if they were there, but uh, that, that would be one of them that's on the list. But Hodge, again, we quote him, regeneration is the infusion of a new principle of life into this corrupt nature. The single nature is gradually being eroded, as I said, extirpated, in favor of a growing spiritual life is the typical reform model. And again, it's all God doing it. No real mechanics as to what, you know, if there's any involvement day by day. And so there really isn't, you know, when you come right down to it, uh, you know, unless they're busy, you know, about doing the business of the church. You know, it's a lot of good works type stuff, living a moral life, doing good works and good deeds and things like that. And and, and unfortunately, a lot of times, not a lot of spiritual growth because it's just not there. So we see the reform view as far as the two natures. Now, here is the Jeffarian, Keswick, and Pentecostal Assembly of God view. We have two natures in conflict. As you can see, the old natures um, disposed to sin, as Ephesians 4.22 says, corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and we are given a new nature, a new creation in Christ, created in righteousness and true holiness, as Ephesians 4.24 says. As we line up, you know, what the believer looks like, then after salvation, we've got the battle between the two trinities, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's our sin nature, the flesh. Doing battle against the divine trinity, the Father, Son, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And we make volitional choices, as Romans 6 spells out to either yield our members to unrighteousness or to yield our members unto God. Again, I think the Scripture is very clear on that as to the two-nature view. But it is one of the critical issues that's to be covered when it comes to experiential sanctification. Probably running close to my time here. Like we're, we're, we're not too far from being done here. Um, okay. Then we come to the Wesleyan holiness view. And here, you know, you got the, uh, like the salvation is we got a, uh, the new life is seeded at this point in your, at time. But then, uh, you know, you've got that, that sin nature that's just standing in your way. You just can't be holy because of that sin nature. And so you have to get it removed. And the second work of grace does it. And immediately, you know, you're perfect in their view or become, you know. Um... And again, I've had a, I had a brother-in-law that was of the, actually was the Wesleyan Holy. Yeah, he was Wesleyan Holy. That was the name of his church. In fact, now I think of it, he's now with the Lord, and hopefully there he knows better. And I hope I don't have to learn something different. But anyway, um, again, uh, we could well tell the rest of the family, as you probably can with other of your own brothers-in-law, that it didn't happen to you. Maybe anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, there was kind of a, a problem with that, huh? Well, the, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the fifth issue, that we remember there's six in all. The fifth issue is the role of the Holy Spirit and the mechanics of walking by the Spirit. Again, the reform model, again, the Spirit is, has, has a place in sanctification as the, uh, of the believer as sovereignty, as so, he sovereignly transforms the believer's moral and spiritual character. So the Spirit is gradually working within you to 
you know, not crucify, I don't want to use that term, to ex extirpate the sin nature while, uh, you know, in, in transferring you over to moral and holy living is kind of the idea. And Hodge again says the spirit, of a, the spirit is a controlling influence which determines their inward and outward life. Again, in this system, there are no clear mechanics as to how the believer walks in the spirit. And again, I tried to study some of the you know, more popular authors in our day that would give, you know, the, the, their congregations, well, what do you do? You know, how do you, how do you walk in the Spirit? And I didn't find much. The process is left, really, again, to God's sovereignty, as far as that view is concerned. Wesley and Holiness, Keswick and Pentecostal models, the Holy Spirit is a part of the second work lying beyond salvation. And again, as I said, continuing confusion between the baptism of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, and uh, His role, really, is pretty much experiential. Uh, tongues and the other manifestations that that I mentioned earlier, and you, you know, just watch a little Christian TV and you'll see some of those <laughs> pretty clear. Uh, no clear mechanics, though, as to how you biblically walk in the Spirit, as you see. Uh, the Chafarian model, and here we've got probably the clearest, and come right down to it. This model is the only one with a clear threefold mechanic, mechan system of mechanics for walking in the Spirit and for the Spirit's part in our experiential sanctification stage. We, we are to grieve not the Spirit, which has to do with the involvement of sin in our lives. We are not to quench the Spirit, which involves uh, yielding to being led. You know, you're sitting next to that guy on the airplane, those of you who flew in, and, and um, all of a sudden he leans over and says, Where are you, what, are you, what are you going to Houston for? And when you say pastor's conference, all of a sudden he's opened the door for a witness at that point, and that Spirit is inside you saying, Give it to him. And you say, well, I don't want to get into that. I'm tired. And, you know, you quenched him. That's what you did at that point. And, of course, walk in the Spirit, which is our ongoing dependence. And Robbie will be dealing with that in the sense of abiding in Christ. And when we, when we don't, again, sin clearly is handled by 1 John 1, 9, by confessing our sins, as, uh, as Scripture, again, is, is very clear as far as the Chafarian model is concerned. Okay, uh, last points here, the... The means of victory in the Christian life. Again, reform model, it's the sovereignty of God all the way. That's the way you get victory. And, you know, if, if, I hope they feel it. <laughs> I guess we'll say Wesley and Holiness model, second work of grace. Again, the fact that your sin nature supposedly is removed and you are now free to live holy. You know, but the question is, and I've not taken the time to read any of the books of those that walked away from these, you know, some of these groups because I, you know, be, you know, because they were thinking, well, it's not working for me. You know, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I, you know, what happened? How come it didn't take with me? See, that's one of the problems with having a faulty view of, of sanctification is that it many times does terrible harm to, to, to believers who could ultimately be transformed to the image, uh, conformed to the image of God's Son, as, as Romans 8, 29 tells us. Uh, Keswick model, victory is attained only as the believer surrenders. You know, so the idea is, I've, I've surrendered my life to God, and, uh, and so you're, you're going to do it, God, but, you know, <laughs> how many times do they take it back? You know, I've seen ex you know, ex some experiential things that, you know, they... It, again, it's, there's no clear mechanic, as you see, no real victory. Pentecostal model, it's one experience after the other. And that's why you see, you know, moving from tongues to holy glue on the stage to barking up in Toronto to the, the, the laughing, whatever the laughing thing was that I saw one time. And then the, the one, that, the last one at least I saw, running up and down the aisle, supposedly you got a, I don't know, a holy spurt, sprinting? I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> But, you know, it's out there. And as believers, you know, we're called upon to preach God's truth. And, you know, we've got to start with the Word. Because it's the Word that defines these things, not, by and large, not experience. Chaffer's model. Victory is attained as the Spirit walks, as the believer walks as close, in close dependence by the Spirit and confesses your sins, abiding, abiding in Christ is the, the, the model there. So uh, again, I was just going to run through these very quickly just to get your mind upon them. That was our main diagram, Wesleyan Holiness. Again, sin nature's gone by second work of grace. Reform model, onward and upward uh, by the sovereignty of God, the idea. Keswick model, let go, surrender to God totally, and let Him you know, run the life. Uh, Pentecostal Holiness, similar thing, only it's called the baptism of the Spirit accompanied by tongues. 
And then you're able to live in the power of the Spirit. And the Chafferian model, that was the classic one. And again, I do want you to note that Dr. Chaffer had a stronger emphasis really upon, that's why I've put spiritual there on the side, spiritual carnal, you see that part? Where the spiritual was really, re, you know, in a sense, submitting yourselves onto the Lord in the sense of uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, not presenting your members as, you know, to unrighteousness, but presenting them unto God. Uh, than at least was emphasized to me. That's why I didn't add it into the Walford Ryrie model as I've studied their writings on it. And the modified Jeffurian model, where we have an absolute spirituality being portrayed there, growth taking place as you are walking in the Spirit, and some loss of it as you're not, and uh, really uh, kind of the downtrodden, depressed Christian life as you're not either. Um, so, Next comes the details, and that's for the speakers who will follow after me. So I'll ask, our, do I have any time for questions, by the way? I'm not sure what the time scale is here. If we do. Any questions for me that I hopefully can answer? If so, uh, we've got a couple microphones that will follow you around. Tommy. Where would you put Calvary Chapel? I think I put them with Assembly of God, yes, because they're, and they are moving away from, from the tongue stuff. Quite, I mean, it's basically de-emphasized, major way. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, by the way, Tommy asked, you didn't have a microphone. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to. Tommy asked, where would you put Calvary Chapel? And you just heard the answer. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Where would you place uh, Miles Stanford and also Watchman Nee? Boy, I I know I'm st I, I can't answer that. I don't... Uh, I, I, I've heard Miles Stan, of Miles Stanford, Watchman Nee, I did have some association with in time past, but I don't know. I can't answer that one. Uh, he would, at least from my understanding, tend to be more the Keswick. Tommy, do you know what the answer would that would be, Watchman Nee? Uh, where yeah. Where would you put Garvey? Oh, Garvey. I would doubt. Uh, Again, from what I what, what I know of Darby's spiritual you know spiritual life concept, yeah, I think I, I think he'd fit closer to Chafer, tell you the truth. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that's why there was such a <coughs> easy fit. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I see that as well. Yes. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Let me close with a word of prayer, and then uh, you got a break. For how long? Let me know how long a break could be. Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to quickly overview these views, and we pray now for the rest of the speakers who fill in some detail and add, again, a lot of stuff that, uh, again, is, is, is uh, for our edification, and blessing. Bless now the refreshments to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.